Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am here again with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with the Republic. As always, there is a PDF link in the description box. And we are now in book four. And today we're going to be finally going into the virtues. But first, just a quick recap of some of the things that we covered last time that will be relevant as we go forward. So starting here on page 329, and this is around 423 B or C, we saw that um, the city should only be allowed to grow so large as to remain a unity and not grow any further. And we also saw that they need to guard their education, um, their education and their nurture. See at the very bottom of the page, they must guard their education. And on the next page, you see it's their nurture. And then he goes on to say that for if a right education makes of them reasonable men and women, of course, they will easily discover everything of this kind and other principles that we now pass over. And so that means they have to be watchful of innovation. So if you scroll down to the bottom of page 331, you can see they must throughout be watchful against innovations in music and gymnastics counter to the established order. And last week we had a nice long discussion about what that might mean. I'm going to jump a little bit ahead now. So here I am at um, page 337. This is 425D for those of you using a different translation. And we see at the bottom of the page here that for most of the enactments that are needed about these things, they will easily discover them themselves. So if you have that education and nurture, then that will guide you. And so that's what we talked about last time. And that brings us... My mouse just, my cursor just disappeared. Where is it? Hold on a second. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump now to, to section six. And so this is uh, 427D. And it is on page 345 in the lobe. Okay, this is where we ended off last time. So we finished that discussion about the unity that's needed in the state and therefore by analogy in the soul. We talked about what a bit about what that would mean. And now Socrates says that at last your city may be considered as established. Okay, so now we've made our city, even though there are no laws. <laughs> we've said that well, there are the laws that are at the foundation, but we're not going to have lots of regulations. Okay, but we're done. We made our state. And so now from here, we're going to go on to look at the virtues. Was there anything either of you wanted to add or um ask about or clarify from last time. Okay, then we'll just go forward. Okay. So when you're ready, we'll keep the same roles if you're fine. We'll go on sure. with section six. At last then, son of Ariston, your city may be considered as established. The next thing is to procure a sufficient light somewhere and to look yourself and call in the aid of your brother and of Polemarchus and the rest, if we may in any wise discover where justice and injustice should be in it, wherein they differ from one another, and which of the two he must have who is to be happy. Alike, whether his condition is known or not known to all gods and men. Nonsense. You promised that you would carry on the speech yourself, admitting that it would be impious for you not to come to the aid of justice by every means in your power. A true reminder. And I must do so, 
but you also must lend a hand. Well, we will. I expect, then, that we shall find it in this way. I think our city, if it has been rightly founded, is good in the sense, in the full sense of the word. Necessarily. Clearly, then, it will be wise, brave, sober, and just. Clearly. Then, if we find any of these qualities in it, the remainder will be that which we have not found? Surely. Take the case of any four other things. If we were looking for any one of them in anything and recognized the object of our search first, that would have been enough for us. But if we had recognized the other three first, that in itself would have made known to us the thing we are seeking. For, plainly, there was nothing left for it to be but the remainder. Right. And so, since these are four, we must conduct the search in the same way. Clearly. And moreover, the first thing that I think I clearly see therein is the wisdom. And there is something odd about that, it appears. What? Wise in very deed, I think the city that we have described is. For it is well consoled, is it not? Yes. And surely this very thing, good consul, is a form of wisdom? For it is not by ignorance, but by knowledge that men consul well. Obviously. But there are many and manifold knowledges or sciences in the city. Of course. Is it then owing to the science of her carpenters? that a city is to be called wise and well-advised? By no means for that, but rather mistress of the arts of building. Then a city is not to be styled wise because of the deliberations of the science of wooden utensils for their best production? No, I grant you. Is it then because of that of brass implements or any other of that kind? None whatsoever. Nor yet because of the science of the production of crops from the soil, but the name it takes from that is agricultural. Sorry, I think so. You... Okay. Then, is there any science in the city just founded by us residing in any of its citizens which does not take counsel about some particular thing in the city, but about the city as a whole and the betterment of its relations with itself and other states? Why, yes, there is. What is it? And in whom is it found? It is the science of guardianship or government. And it is to be found in those rulers to whom we just now gave the name of guardians in the full sense of the word. And what term, then, do you apply to the city because of this knowledge? Well advised and truly wise. 
Which class, then, do you suppose will be the more numerous in our city? The Smiths or these true guardians? The Smiths by far. And would not these rulers be the smallest of all the groups of those who possess special knowledge and receive distinctive appellations? By far. Then it is by virtue of its smallest class and minutest part of itself, and the wisdom that resides therein, in the part which takes the lead and rules, that a city established on principles of nature would be wise as a whole. And, as it appears, these are by nature the fewest, the class to which it pertains to partake of the knowledge which alone of all forms of knowledge deserves the name of wisdom. Most true. This one of our four, then, we have, I know not how, discovered the thing itself and its place in the state. Hmm. I certainly think that it has been discovered sufficiently. Thank you both. Okay, so going back to the beginning of this section, now that they have established their city, what is the next task? To procure a sufficient light somewhere and to look at yourself. Why would you do that? For what purpose? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Self reflection? No. <laughs> <laughs> Jed, can you give him any help? He says to call in your brother and pull the Marcus and the rest, so we'll call in Jed. Oh dear. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, well, we seem to be looking for wisdom. Is that right? Before we get there, um, what is the ultimate task there? It's right at the bottom of the page. If we may in any wise discover... What? The big J word. Yes. Right, right. Yes. So we're looking for justice and injustice. How they differ from uh, one another. Which of the two you must have to be happy. And whether that condition is known or not known to all gods and men. Right. right. That was, remember, the whole book one and two, that whole long discussion about that led up to like those two hypothetical men, the one that's purely just, but is treated terribly because seen as unjust. And the other one who's purely unjust, but has all the benefits of the image of justice, which is better to be. And so it raised the question also within that whole scenario, that whole hypothetical, there's the idea that the gods do not know which one is truly just and which one it has just the image of justice that was implied, right? Because this, the unjust person supposedly gives lots of money to the gods and so has a place in heaven. That implies the gods also do not know true justice from its image. And so that's included here as well. Do the gods, um, this condition is known, true justice and injustice. What is it in itself? Not the image of it, but the thing in itself. That was the task that was given to Socrates and why he set up this whole analogy to the city-state in the first place. So he's coming back to that. What are justice and injustice? Which one truly makes you happy? And is the condition known to humans, but also to the gods? Okay, so we're back to that. And now he brings in the four virtues. And you see that in the middle of page 347. And I'll give you the Stephanus number in a moment. Um, that would be 427E. We have 
the four, wise, brave, sober, and just. Okay, brave here is courage. And sober is we often translate as temperance or temperate. Okay, so um, wisdom here is Sophia, and um, brave or courageous is Andrea, and uh, soft for soon is what we mean by temperance or soberness, and justice is DK. So now they have a plan of how they're going to come about. They have, we have four virtues, and we only really are looking for justice. Are they going to start with justice? Are they just no. going to throw the other three aside? Start with wisdom. Why does he start with wisdom? Well, I saw a YouTube video, and it placed wisdom right at the top of this pyramid. <laughs> I think you're cheating. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th it is right at the top there. That's right. When we get to the tripartite soul. So they have a plan here. Um, he says, take any of anything. Um, take the case of any four other things. If we were looking for any one of them and we recognize the object of our search first, that would have been enough for us. But if we recognize the other three first, that in itself would have made known to us the thing we were seeking. For plainly, there was nothing left for it to be but the remainder. Right, so he introduces this idea that if we find the other three, so justice is hard to find, apparently, because we're going to find the other three. That's somehow the easier way is to find the other three first and whatever's left is going to be justice. So that's at least the, um, the excuse for giving us wisdom first. But we're going to see, yes, that wisdom is at the top of the pyramid there. And so what did we learn about wisdom here? Can you, were there any sentences that jumped out at you as possible definitions or parts of the definition at least? Good counsel is a form mm -hmm. of wisdom. Good. Yes. Now, there was a whole long talk here about carpenters and um, architects. What was all that about? Did you understand what was going on there? Just that the, the uh, quality of the city is not defined by those craftsmen, mm. but by the guardians mm -hmm. as, as rulers, not as the army, but as mm. rulers. Mm. But yeah, so it's not just any council. It has to be a particular kind of council, right? What kind of council are we looking for here? wise counsel truly wise <laughs> <laughs> well we can't that may be true but we can't define wisdom as wise counsel so what kind of what's it's not the the counsel of a carpenter what what type of counsel are we looking for Another not answer, but they are the smallest hmm. group of yes, crafts. That's coming up. We'll hold on to that for a moment. Hmm. Yeah, this highlighter is not doing what I want it to do. So I apologize to those watching on YouTube for the um, excessive amount of highlighting here. It's more than just what I wanted to cover. But I want to point you all now to the top of page 351, where he says that it's we're not taking counsel about some particular thing in the city, but about the city as a whole and the betterment of its relations with itself and other states. 
And remember, wherever we see states or city, this is the analogy to the soul. So you want to plug in soul there. We're looking at the soul as a whole. And remember that whole last section, what we did last week, looking at the unity of, of the soul, that it, we, it should be functioning as a unity. And so this builds on that, that this wise counsel is looking at the soul as a whole, as a unity, and the betterment of its relations with itself, within itself, keeping that unity. Because remember, it shouldn't grow any larger than it would be allowed to grow while still remaining a unit. It has to remain a unity. Don't grow any larger than that. And so its relations with itself is important, how we communicate with ourselves. And remember, we also saw something last week about how the first thing to slip is our music and gymnastics, that we need to keep an eye on that. So keeping its relations with itself, watching your state of mind, watching your energy, and wherever you see yourself starting to slip, you've got to catch it quickly. And that's part of this wise counsel. And also, um, if, you if you do that well, then you're also going to relate to other people well, other souls. And so he calls this the science of guardianship or government. Okay, so in our analogy of the city-state to the soul, government would be how you rule over your own soul. And then to bring in what Jacob was saying, that it's the smallest class, the minutest part of itself, but the wisdom resides there. And it's the, that's the part that was going to take the lead and rule. And a city or a, a city establishes on principles of nature would be wise as a whole. Okay, so again, you need to apply that to the soul to see that whatever he means by wisdom, it's that smallest part of you which rules the soul as a whole, keeps it a unity, keeps an eye on music and gymnastics, on the energy and the state of mind. Not letting that slip. Okay, any thoughts or questions or comments? Or? I have one. Okay. We, we had a series of um, examples mm -hmm. that was tracing the idea of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? So this guardianship that rules our soul... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. requires a certain kind of knowledge. And then mm -hmm. he went on to say, it's a science of guardianship. I'm wondering what the word science is in the Greek there. Because I wonder if um, knowledge has a mm -hmm. certain word, if it's mm. techne or episteme or noose. That all are sometimes called knowledges, but they're very different. Mm -hmm. And what's this one here when it says science? Guardian. Mm. Yeah. Um, I see it at a higher place. Um, is there a science in the city? This science I just found is episteme. Uh, maybe the later one as well. I'd have to search a little more. Hmm. But I'm guessing episteme. But I'll have to, I'll confirm that. Oh, I see episteme again. Yeah, I think it's episteme. Would that be the same word that they're using when they're talking about the knowledge of this or that? Yeah, episteme is usually used to talk about a particular branch of knowledge or, or study. So where you see science in the Old English, it means a branch of study. So we're at the physical level. And our use of science as like a class in high school. Yeah. Okay, so now we have some idea of wisdom, that it's the smallest part and it's what is guiding us. And we know that we want that it helps us, um, helps the betterment of our relation with ourselves. 
and with other states, and it deals with the city as a whole. It leads and rules. Okay, and that's wisdom. And so now we're going to go on then to courage, or what he's calling here bravery. In other places, he calls it courage, but in this section, he's using the word bravery. Okay, but now we're going to go on then to the next of the, um, and there's no particular order that you have to present these in, but they are presented in the order of like if you were to, once we get to the tripartite soul, if you were to break the three parts, make like a triangle and break it into three parts, this would be the order. Okay, so Jacob, whenever you're ready, we'll go on to section seven. Okay. But again, there is no difficulty in seeing bravery itself and the part of the city in which it resides, for which the city is called brave. How so? Who is calling a city cowardly or brave would fix his eyes on any other part of it than that which defends itself and wages war in its behalf. No one at all. For the reason I take it that the cowardice or the bravery of the other inhabitants does not determine for it the one quality or the other. It does not. Bravery, too, then, belongs to a city by virtue of a part of itself owing to its possession in that part of a quality that under all conditions will preserve the conviction that things to be feared are precisely those which and such as the lawgiver inculca inculcated in their education. Is not that which you call bravery? I don't altogether understand what you said, but say it again. A kind of conservation is what I mean by bravery. What sort of a conservation? The conservation of the conviction which the law has created by education about fearful things. What and what sort of things are to be feared? And by the phrase, under all conditions, I mean that the brave man preserves it both in pain and pleasures and in desires and fears and does not expel it from his soul. And I may illustrate it by a similitude, if you please. I please. You are aware that dyers, when they wish to dye wool so as to hold the purple hue, begin by selecting from the many colors there be the one nature of the white and then give it a careful preparatory treatment so that it will take the hue in the best way. And after the treatment, then and then only dip it in the dye. And things that are dyed by this process become fast colored, and washing, either with or without lies, cannot take away the sheen of their hues. But otherwise, you know what happens to them, whether anyone dips other colors, or even these without the preparatory treatment. I know that they present a ridiculous and washed-out appearance. By this analogy, then, you must conceive what we two to, 
what we two, to the best of our ability, were doing when we selected our soldiers and educated them in music and exercises of the body. The sole aim of our contrivance was that they should be convinced and receive our laws like a die, as it were, so that their belief and faith might be fast-colored, both about the things that are to be feared and all other things because of the fitness of their nature and nurture and that so their dyes might not be washed out by those lies that have such dread power to scour our faiths away. Pleasure more potent than any detergent or astringent to accomplish this, and pain and fear and desire more sure than any lie. This power in the soul, then, this unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief about things to be and not to be feared, is what I call and would assume to be courage, unless you have something different to say. No, nothing. For well, I presume that you consider mere right opinion about the same matters not produced by education, that which may manifest itself in a beast or a slave, to have little or nothing to do with law, and that you would call it by another name than courage. That is most true. Well then, I accept this as bravery. Do so, and you will be right with the reservation that it is the courage of a citizen. Some other time, if it please you, we will discuss it more fully. At present, we were not seeking this, but justice. And for the purpose of that inquiry, I believe we have done enough. I, uh, you are quite right. Hmm. right. Do you think it's enough? Now you have a perfect understanding of courage. Perfect. <laughs> Let's go back through this. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what courage is. Now, going back to page 353, he gives us a bit of a definition here. It's a quality that under all conditions will preserve the conviction that things to be feared are precisely those which are such as the lawgiver inculcated in their education. Now, fortunately for us, Glaucon did not understand. And he said, say it again. Okay, is it any clearer? What is the next way that he clarified it? Knowing yeah. what should be feared. Mm. Right. He added the idea of knowing what is to be feared. Or, well, yeah, he said that a bit in the first one, too. So it's a conviction that things to be feared are precisely those which are as the lawgiver inculcated. Now he, now he clarifies that the law has created by education about fearful things. What sorts of things are to be feared? It was taught in our education. And then he explains that by the phrase, under all conditions. What does he mean by that? Now he brings in... Four terms that are key to understanding his definition of courage. What are these four terms? Pain, pleasure, desire, fears. Mm, right. We have these two sets, pain and pleasure, desires and fears. And we can also see how fear and pain are connected and desire and pleasure. 
And now to explain how he's tying all this together, he gives us an analogy. Now, what we want to do here is pull out all of the terms that he used. Right, so we have the wool, so some sort of material that we're working with. What are some of the other terms that are key to this analogy? Like the one that he said, I find it now, it was like true colored or fast colored. Fast colored. I guess just means like it's not going to fade or exactly. no matter how mm -hmm. much you mm -hmm. wash it. Right. Any other phrases that would be key to this analogy? Preparatory, preparatory treatment, maybe? Yeah. Yes. Anything you would add, Jed? Um, there's the idea of the dyers. Don't know if that plays a role. Maybe that's the... Uh, mm -hmm. Or givers or educators. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of faith. The power of what? Power to scour our faiths away. Mm. Um, that's interesting because I, I'm not sure if faith would be in there. Maybe belief because he is saying the power. Well, we're. Right now, we're looking at the analogy, and so we're picking out the pieces of this whole idea of dyeing some wool. Detergent. Hmm. Right, yes. The lies and detergents. Yeah, so we have, so there are the dyers, they have some sort of material, wool. Um, also, I'm going to add the nature of the white. We want to, um, the preparatory treatment is to return to the nature of the white, and then you can dye it, and it will become fast colored, so that even when you use detergents and lyes, and yeah, we don't use the word lyes anymore in modern English, it's just soaps. Um, maybe a little confusing because um, it sounds like our you know, lie is so like a non-truth but it's just soap. And those will not, um, even when you use these soaps or detergents, you will not wash away the dye. And so now what you need to do is take this to the analogy to the soul and see what each of these things corresponds to. So, some of this maybe we'll need to do as homework because you may want to think about it, go through it a little bit more. But looking at it initially here, um, Jacob, what jumps out at you is this must be the connection. I, I see a purificatory mm -hmm. phase mm -hmm. at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Right, the preparatory treatment is some sort of purification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I don't know. After that, I don't know. What would the wool be? That should that one. I think we can establish. Is it your soul? Mm, that would make sense. Right? Okay. If we're making an analogy to the soul, so this wool, this material that we're working with, is like working with the soul. And so then the dyer would be who? Jed, you brought that one in. The dyer. What would the dyer be in the analogy? I think there are two things here. There is mm -hmm. the educators, because he's talking about selecting certain people, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. 
the importance of gymnastics and mm. music. Um, mm -hmm. So we could say the teacher, or we could say ourselves, um, mm -hmm. that part of us right. that mm -hmm. rules and governs mm -hmm. and selects the, mm -hmm. the what mm -hmm. part of our soul is best at doing music and gymnastics. Right. That's good. Yes. Yeah. So we already found then wisdom is that part of us that rules. And so that ruler, then whether it's through a teacher or not, maybe with the help of a teacher, but certainly that ruler part in the soul is what is doing this work right, on the soul as a whole. Which brings in the idea of belief. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. the faith word there is um, not faith the way we understand it. It's probably a translation mm -hmm. of belief. Mm -hmm. But the idea that a guardian or ruler or teacher is establishing it really plays into the idea of belief. Hmm. Well, we'll hold on to that for a moment because we have to, as we open it up more, it'll become clear, right? How that would fit in. Um, the nature of the white. The purification is to bring back. So the purification of the wool is to bring it back to a, a pure white state. What would that be in terms of our analogy to the soul? Getting rid of, or like maybe identifying your pathologos. Hmm. Good, yeah. Remember, we, remember when we saw music, we wanted to be established in the law that God is always good and God does not deceive us or change shape. Any belief other than that, or any belief contradictory to those laws, need to be thrown out. Good. Like um, uh, angry, um, who was the angry guy really wanting to jump into the conversation and, and argue with certainty that injustice is better? Thrasymachus at the beginning of the... Thrasymachus. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to be like him. Like, he's not going to take anything on board with that attitude. Mm. Mm. That's right. Yeah. So there is some purification that's needed first. But then what are the dyes? Well, if the dyer <laughs> is wisdom... And I guess it would make sense to say that the dyes are virtue. Does that make uh, sense? But we're, well, this is one of the virtues. Right. Mm. Mm. Let's look at it again. Um, so you're aware that dyers, when they wish to dye wool so as to hold the purple hue, begin by selecting from the many colors there, there be, the one nature of the white, and then give it a careful preparatory treatment so that it will take the hue in the best way. So remember that we had to choose the most likely candidates, the best candidates, even before we subject them to education those that had the best nature, and then we're going to nurture them with education. Okay, so you start with the purest souls and then give them, and then they go through the preparatory treatment. Is this like, Which is the dye education. would be like nurture or mm, Okay, hold on, well, let's hold on for a moment here. Um, um, and after the treatment, then and only then, dip it in the dye. And things that are dyed by this process become fast colored. And washing either with or without lyes, they cannot take away the sheen of their hues. So you take these pure souls that have had some degree of purification and we're going to dip them in dyes. 
Can can I go right back to the start? His first argument was we wouldn't look to the whole of a city when establishing what courage is. We would only look to a part, and it's the part to do with um, defending and and fighting war. Mm -hmm. Is Mm. is this significant? Well, is is that the right reading of that? And is that significant here when we're saying choosing souls within a city, choosing a part within the whole of ourself? Yeah, we are focusing on a certain part of the soul. So we've got to divide our own soul into parts and see what part of us Mm. is capable of doing this Mm. and then put all the bleach all the color out of it so we can stick Mm -hmm. the dye in. Mm. Interesting. How would you see the parts of your own soul? Well, we'll hold on to that because when we get to a later section, we're going to see the tripartite soul. So we'll put that on hold for now. So we've got, so there's that part of the soul that can do this. And it's been, there's some and some degree of purification. And now we're going to dip it in the dye. And so we need to think about what that dye is. Something that will allow it to be fast colored and it won't wash out. And maybe we'll hold on to that for a moment and see what happens when it's fast colored. And that's at the bottom of the page. The sole aim of our contrivance, do you see that it's at the bottom of page 355? The sole aim of our contrivance was that they should be convinced and received our laws like a dye. There's a hint there as it were, so that their belief and faith might be fast-colored, both about the things that are to be feared and all other things, because of the fitness of their nature and nurture, and that so that their dyes might not be washed out by those lies that have such dread power to scour our faiths away. And then he gives some examples. So looking at that part there, do you have a better sense of what the dyes are? They're not going to be well. Okay, for the for the dyes, I'm mm-hmm. based on that sentence. Mm-hmm. I want to double down and uh-huh. say it was nurture or education mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Based on that sentence, right? They received our laws like a dye, and that's about as <laughs> direct <laughs> as he can be. Right? <laughs> okay, good, good. Mm. So the laws and the education are the die. And And once you have this conviction, there's been some initial purification. Now you've taken the education, you've gone further with it. And it's really become, you're now grounded in that. And now it becomes fast colored. And I think what you'll find with all of the with all four of the virtues is that they're not an all or nothing thing. Right. We're constantly growing and our. Um, our convictions will get stronger. Right. As we go from right opinion to understanding and as we go deeper into understanding and it's a long road in understanding. But as we go on, our convictions become stronger. Right. So it, it, it sounds here the way it's described. And I think he has to kind of describe it this way as if it's like a, you finish this stage and then you go on to this one and this one. But it's actually it's more of like the, the spiral image, the spring right, that spirals up and you go into many layers. But over time, it becomes more and more fast colored, if you will. Um, and it cannot be washed out. The further you go with this, the more your convictions become get closer to knowledge. The, more, the deeper your understanding is, the less likely these will ever be washed away. And so the lies and detergents to see what they are, um, that our faith cannot be scoured away. 
And yes, Jed mentioned this idea of faith. What do we mean by faiths? And so that's a question to hold on to because, of course, people coming from a religious background have a certain teaching about what faith is. Um, the general definition of faith is that it's a belief that cannot be proven or disproven. But um, there is also the idea that was introduced. Oh, I wish I could remember the thinker's name. I can tell you next time. But, um, but there is a, a Catholic um, priest in the second century who defined faith as an impossible belief. Which actually takes it then to a new layer because, and I've met many people, and this always confused me when I was growing up, is people who, when I point out, I used to be quite, um, quite the skeptic about spirituality and was more in the um, agnostic, atheistic path. And, and during that stage, when I would question people and point out all the crazy things about the Bible, and they'd say like, well, that's, but my faith but I, I still have faith. And because I can believe it, even though it's impossible, that's proof that I am spiritual. And so there's that idea. That's like a, a twisted version of faith that believing something that's impossible, like eating the cracker in, in church, it really is Christ's body, not just symbol, not just um, symbolic of it, excuse me, but it's the actual body. To believe that is impossible. And so the idea that to believe it is proof that you are more spiritual than somebody who would reject it. Um, that's an idea that I've heard many times. And it, I think it goes back to the second century thinker. Um, and probably also would explain um, faith that take that to the next step of like, you know, Donald Trump was sent by God. <laughs> it wouldn't go right there. Um, the most impossible thing to believe is proof that you are truly spiritual. So there are many ideas about faith. I don't mean to get off topic here, but what is faith? It has a different meaning for different people. Um, so we do have to think about what it means here in this context, in this platonic context. Um, but he gives us a little bit more about it here, talking about pleasure. And so there's a there's a, a a more positive way to understand faith than the distorted one that we were just talking about. And so we want to see what that is. And we see that it will not take that it will not be washed away by pleasures more potent than any detergent or abstringent to accomplish this. In pain and fear and desire more sure than any lie. So we can see here that the the lie, the detergents are being compared to these these things that might take away our convictions, right? Wash away, but they, but if we um, color fast our wool in the way described, then pleasure, pain, fear, and desire will not wash our teeth, the dye away. I our think, education and our nurture. Mm -hmm. I think we got a clue here when he, mm -hmm. it stood out to me as something unusual. And I've mm -hmm. come to realize that when that happens, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, when mm -hmm. he said, oh, can you repeat it? Can you hear it again? Can I hear it again? So mm -hmm. while we've kind of looked at someone like uh, Thrasymachus, who started full of colors, and then the end of the book, he's left... Um, he doesn't really have an idea of justice. He's sort of like, oh, I don't know. Like he's aware that he doesn't know. So it's mm -hmm. like ignorant, like the good kind of ignorance. Like mm -hmm. I'm aware that I'm uh, unaware, um, mm -hmm. which is a change. And then here, following that kind of interaction with Socrates, you've got someone saying, Socrates, repeat it again, repeat it again, say it again. I, I, you've, you've said it before, but... I remember that saying, um, if it's, I think Socrates says, if it's worth saying, it's worth saying many times. Um, and hearing that in this dialogue, it reminds me of really baking in, or, or that's not the right word, really putting that dye in, which mm. is a, not an absurd belief you're getting from someone else, like faith, mm -hmm. but a mm. rational one he's getting from mm. Socrates. He doesn't understand it himself, mm. otherwise he would remember it. He wouldn't ask it to be repeated. 
it's mm-hmm. coming from someone else, but it's it's being mm-hmm. put in there through a kind of belief from somebody else. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. So that part of the education is the repetition of it. And we don't get it just once. And it's not just an all or nothing thing. It is going to come in stages and we're going to gradually grow. And the education takes time because actually the purification, it's, it's not really just like you purify, you get rid of all your pathologos and then you take in all this education. It doesn't really, we know in real practice, it doesn't happen that way. But we start with these laws and we, well, we have to come to this um, practice with a certain um, right opinion about it, right? And I think that that's part of what he's getting at with this idea of um, selecting the students. Like not everybody is going to be interested in doing philosophy. And I think part of that is also, it's not just within the one soul, but also looking at people like who's going to be drawn to it and who isn't, which souls will be drawn to it and which won't. And the ones that are most likely to take to it, the ones with the right opinion about it, they're the ones that go through this education. And there is some maybe initial um, purification that you need to go through before the education will take hold. Oh, then once you accept those laws and you start to see and start to gain some understanding of it now you're on the path and you'll find that your conviction becomes stronger the more you go on until you eventually get to the place where you are fast colored as he puts it here and you have a certain conviction about it and he calls it faith but you have to but of course, you want to think a little more about what he means by that. What, what is that state of mind of having this conviction? Because he's tying the idea of faith here to courage, right? Part of his definition of courage. And so you're not going to be distracted by pleasures. And you're not going to be distracted by pain. And of course, when you're looking at fear and desire, you're looking to the future, that you want more pleasure. The pleasure you have now or the pleasure you had yesterday, you want it again. So that's desire. Or, or there's a, a pleasure you want to have that you've never had, that you're desiring. And fear is the, you're imagining pain. You're not in it now. All right, they're different things. And he said that the pleasure is more dangerous than pain, mm-hmm. which is interesting. That's right. It's quite the distraction. Because many people have been in pain and they drop to their knees and pray to God. But pleasure is a real distraction. Yeah, and I'm going to, just to end this part of the discussion, let me put the color. Okay, blue. Okay, so this power in the soul then. This unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief. And again, belief and faith, is it the same? Is it different? Or what are they? What does he mean there? Hold on to that. This power in the soul, then, this unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief about things to be and not to be feared is what I call and would assume to be courage. So there's his definition of courage. So restating what he had said earlier, but now after the analogy, he can state it like this. Okay, so we're going to come back to this then. We'll start with this next week. So um, a little homework is to maybe think more about this over the week. And then we'll come back and we can discuss it a little bit more. So I think that would be a better way to talk about it. Give you some time to think about it first. Okay, so we'll come back to this, take a look at what this would be. And now we've got two virtues. We've looked at wisdom and courage, so we can look at how they fit together and um, what this would mean to us in practice, how to do this. Okay, so that's where we'll pick it up next time. And then we'll also go on then to suffer soon, or what he's calling here soberness or temperance in some translations. Sound-mindedness is another one I've seen. There are a number of different ways to, to translate it, but soft for soon. What is it? 
That's what we'll look at next time, and we'll also be able to finally go into justice. Okay. So, those of you watching on YouTube, I thank you for watching. And as always, if you do have any questions or comments, you can put those below. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention this, but um, somebody did put a comment in last week that apparently he or she, I don't remember the name of the person, but um, he or she had um, tried to comment, but it got erased. And the person was unhappy about it. And then that person erased. And I said, please put it again. I didn't. It wasn't me who had erased it. Um, but the person erased the whole thread. So um, I wasn't able to follow through with it. But I did um, ask um, YouTube services um, why it would get erased. And it has to do with maybe their guidelines. It is possible for me as a YouTuber to monitor, to have certain keywords that I would want pulled. I did not use any. So if something gets erased, it's not because of me. But it's possible that if you put something that includes some keyword that would get flagged in general for any site, um, then it may get pulled. So there are certain guidelines. So you can check the, the guidelines of um, how to make comments. But I do apologize if anything has been erased. It is not me erasing them. OK, so please follow the guidelines and put a comment below that does not get flagged. And so we can all share your your thoughts and maybe have a little discussion about it. And as always, um, please like, share with your friends, subscribe if you don't already. And I hope you'll join us next week. Thank you very much.